Uh, we'll move the agenda here in just a couple of seconds. I want you to know following this, there will be a panel of four up here. There is no way to do what we know we should do when all four, so we'll deal with that upon their departure uh, to express our applause to them and our thanks when they are here. But we are now ready to move the agenda as far as I know. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in welcoming to the room the Honorable Bernie Sanders! single fight, every single round, he's answered the bell. He's been there for things that we care about. So he's terrific on all of our issues. But what I really want to say is, every time during the, <clears throat> during the campaign, Bernie's out on the trail, or in debates, doing town halls, I found my, I found myself originally saying, right, for everything he said, right, right. And it became darn right, darn right. And at the end it was damn right, damn right. Bernie made the good fight. In the I have two heroes in life. One is Sergeant Shriver, who was very important to me. The second was Bobby Kennedy. I have a third, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Bernie Sanders is one of the heroes of my life. Please welcome Senator Bernie Sanders. Thank you. David, David and I have known each other for a very, very long time, and uh, actually a number of years ago, David visited us uh, in Vermont, helped me come back, <coughs> uh, and I want you all to know that there are very few people, if any, over the years who have stood up and fought for low-income people more vigorously and more effectively than David Bradley. David, thank you. Thank you. I also want to thank uh, Steve Geller and Dennis Mason and Pat Burke with the Southeastern Vermont Community Action, uh, also people I've known for many years who do a great job every single day. Uh, and I want to thank all of you, because you are all unsung heroes and heroines. You have enormously difficult jobs, because in many ways, it's two steps forward and one step back, or maybe one step forward and two steps back. You were there on, in the battleground uh, on issues that are basically ignored here in Washington and are largely ignored by the national media. You are struggling to make sure that in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, embarrassingly, people and children have enough food in which to survive, that people stay warm uh, in the winter time when the weather gets 20 below zero, uh, that people have a dignified life. And you do that every single day, and your staffs do that every single day, so I just want to take this opportunity to thank you all, and I wish very much 
that we as a nation were providing you with the support that you need. We're not. But you keep going day after day and year after year. You're doing God's work. You're doing the right thing. Thank you very much for all that you do. Now, it's my view that as a nation, we cannot go forward, we cannot address the issues that we face unless we have the courage to actually examine them. You don't go forward by sweeping major problems under the rug any more than your health is going to be improved by ignoring some of the physical symptoms you may have. May not be good news, but you gotta bring out into the open the reality of what's going on in America today. <coughs> So here is some of that reality that we as a nation have got to address. Is the economy overall better today than it was when George W. Bush left office? And the answer is that after eight years of President Obama, the economy is better. That's a fact. <laughs> but, but despite the reality that when Bush left office, we were losing 800,000 jobs a month and now we're gaining a couple of hundred thousand jobs a month. Despite the reality that we've made good progress in lowering the federal deficit, despite the obvious reality that when Bush left office, our world's financial system was on the verge of collapse, not only in the United States, but all over the world. That's not the case today. So all of that is true, but there is another reality that you know better than any group in the United States of America. And that is that there are tens of millions of people who are barely making it, who are barely keeping their heads above water economically. And it's not just the unemployed, and it's not just the disabled. I was in Iowa last year, and I was out, uh, out and talking to some folk, folks at a farmer's market, and I talked to a guy uh, whose job what it was is to collect the food that was not sold and he took it to an emergency food bank. And I said, tell me, how many of the people, what percentage of the people go to the emergency food bank who are working, who are employed? He said, 90%, this is Des Moines, Iowa, 90% of the people who go to a food bank in order to get the food they need to make sure their kids don't go hungry are working people. So all over this country, we have folks who are trying to make it on eight or nine or 10 bucks an hour, and they cannot make it on those wages, which is why together we have got to fight for a minimum wage, which is a livable wage, 15 bucks an hour. And what's also not talked about a whole lot is that we are people who go to work every day, every year. But the fact is that real median income is about $1,400 less today than it was in 1999. Got that? That is why people in this country are angry. They're angry because they're going to work. In many cases, they're working not one job, but two jobs, maybe three jobs. Maybe they've seen their jobs go to China, and they're now making 50, 60 percent of what they previously made. And not only are their wages going down in inflation adjusted for dollars, even more significantly for those families, they are scared to death about the future for their children. Right now, when we were growing up, when I was growing up, the absolute expectation and it was true, is that everything being equal, the kids would do better financially than their parents. That is not the truth today. For the first time in the modern history of America, it is likely that the younger generation will have a lower standard of living than their parents. <laughs> and you got parents all over this country, they're saying, I want my kid to go to college but my kid can't afford to go to college or came out of school deeply in debt. I want my kid to have a decent home, but my kid is still living with me 
because he or she cannot afford to buy a home of their own. I want my kid to have a decent job, but all my kid can find is temporary work here, there, and other, way, other places. So we have got to recognize <coughs> that while the economy in general is doing okay, there are many places in this country, in urban America and in rural America, where people are experiencing desperation. And let me give you one example, which is absolutely chilling. It should stun every American. Throughout history, the expectation always was, the reality was, that you and I will live on average longer lives than our parents, who lived longer lives than their parents, and so forth. And that is because of improvements in health care and medicine, public health. People live longer than the past generation. That's the trend all over the world. How many of you know that there are millions of Americans night right now all over this country whose life expectancy will be lower than their parents. I was just in West Virginia the other day, and in the county that I was in, life expectancy is going down, and it's going down not only in that county in West Virginia, in Kentucky, in many parts of this country, because people are living in despair. They can't find decent jobs. They're worried about their kids, and to an horrific level. They are turning to opiates, they are turning to heroin, they are turning to alcohol, they are turning to suicide. And people of 35 and 40 years of age are dying all over these areas because they have given up on life. That should not be the case in the United States of this country. I want all of you to know what I think you all do know. If we were a poor country, if we were having this discussion in Haiti, if we were having it in some poor Latin American country, some poor African country, we would have a certain type of discussion. And that discussion would be, oh, well, of course everybody should have health care, but we're a poor country. We can't afford it. Of course everybody should have a good education. But, you know, we're a poor country. We can't afford it. Brothers and sisters, never for one moment forget you are living today in the wealthiest country in the history of the world. There is no excuse for 43 million people living in poverty. There is no excuse for 28 million Americans having zero health insurance today, God knows what happens after the, if the Republican plan gets passed. 28 million today have no health insurance and more are underinsured with high deductibles and high copayments. And we lose thousands of people every year because they don't have the ability to walk into a doctor's office when they should. Now, I live 50 miles away from the Canadian border. Every major country on earth, including Canada, guarantees health care to all people as a right. So should the United States of America. Everybody knows that in a highly competitive global economy, we need to have the best educated workforce in the world. That many of the new jobs that are being created, the decent paying jobs, require certain levels of technological skills and uh, an educational background in order to do those new jobs. And yet you go all over this country and you find that people cannot get those jobs because they don't have the quality of education that they need. It is not a radical idea to say that in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, 
every child should have the best education possible and that every kid in this country, regardless of his or her income, should know that if they do their schoolwork well, if they take school seriously, that regardless of the income of their family, yes, they will be able to get a higher education because we're going to make public colleges and universities tuition free. Now, what is not talked about very often in the media or among my colleagues in the House and the Senate is that while we are the richest country in the history of the world, most people don't know that because we have seen in the last 30 years a massive transfer of wealth from the middle class to the people on top, and I'm talking about trillions of dollars. What we have got to confront as a nation is a major, not just economic issue, but a moral issue. Is it acceptable? Is it moral? Is it what this country should be about? When the top one-tenth of one percent now owns as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. Is it acceptable that one family, the Walton family of Walmart, one family owns as much wealth as the bottom 42 percent of the American people. Today, the top 1% earns more income than the bottom 65%. So it's not only an unfair distribution of wealth, which is accumulated income. Today, the top 1% earns more income than the bottom 65%. So when you hear people talking about economic growth, that growth doesn't mean anything if that growth is not going to working people and low-income people and the middle class. If all of that growth is going to people on top, it doesn't mean anything. So without getting terribly radical, we need an economy. <laughs> economy that actually works for working families and the middle class, health care for all as a right, high quality education, <clears throat> making public colleges and universities tuition free. These are not radical ideas. These are ideas that in many cases exist in countries throughout the world. Now what do we have now with Mr. Trump as president? Well, for a start, we have a president who sadly lies all of the time. And I say this not out of any partisan glee. I have conservative friends. They believe what they believe in. They disagree with me. They don't lie. They believe what they believe. They try to bring forth their views as best they can. But we have a president who lies all of the time. And he got elected. He got elected by saying, I, Donald Trump, I'm going to provide great health care for everybody. <coughs> Remember that? Well, that great health care for everybody turns out to be throwing 24 million people off of the health insurance they currently have, defunding Planned Parenthood, making devastating cuts in Medicaid, and significantly raising premiums for senior citizens. According to the AARP, under the Republican plan now being discussed, if you are 64 years of age and you're earning $25,000 a year, you are going to have to pay under this new plan $13,000 for your health care premium as opposed to the $1,700 you're paying today. And that means that many elderly people will actually have to give up their health insurance <clears throat> entirely. Trump told the American people that he would not cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Well, obviously, this plan makes devastating cuts to Medicaid. He has 
brought into his administration people who have spent their entire lives advocating for cuts to Social Security and Medicare as well. Furthermore, the President will be introducing a budget, I believe, tomorrow, which we believe will call for a very significant increase in defense spending at a time when our country spends more on defense than the next 12 countries behind us. But in order to pay for that huge increase, there will be cuts in all of the programs that middle income and working people believe and that, that need, and that is education, childcare, nutrition for hungry kids, healthcare, transportation, environmental protection, and much, much more. So here we have a situation where the rich are getting richer and the health care plan Republicans are bringing forth provides $275 billion in tax breaks for the top 2%. Here we have a situation today where low-income people are struggling in a way they have not for decades and his proposal will be to cut programs for low-income and working people in order to increase funding for the military. Those are priorities that, in my view, are absolutely backwards. Those are priorities that represent the needs of the military-industrial complex, priorities that represent the needs of the very wealthiest people in this country. Our job together is to tell Trump and the Congress that maybe, just maybe, instead of listening to wealthy campaign contributors, maybe they should pay attention to the needs of ordinary Americans. Now how do we, how do we stop these? Cuts. How do we change our national priorities? How do we say that we should have a government that represents all of us and not just the 1%? The only way that I know how to do that is to bring together millions and millions of people to give the Republicans a choice that they cannot ignore. And that is that if they go forward with these draconian cuts, if they're gonna throw 24 million people off of health care, if they're gonna cut community health programs, if they're gonna decimate the programs that low-income people depend upon, they are not going to get reelected. So our job is to educate, our job is to organize, because here is the good news. The good news is that in every poll that I have seen, the American people do not support cuts to Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. The American people do not support cuts to the needs of low-income people. The American people do not support tax breaks for billionaires and large corporations. That's what Congress wants to do. That is not what the American people want us to do. So our job, and this is not an easy job given all that you have to do on your day job, taking care of people in need. But our job together is to bring the American people together to stand up for an agenda that works for all of us. <laughs> we can create a nation in which every man, woman, and child enjoys a dignified life with a decent standard of living. We can create a healthcare system that guarantees health care to all people. We can rebuild our crumbling infrastructure and create 15 million jobs as we rebuild our bridges and our water systems and our roads that are today crumbling. We can make sure that our public colleges and universities are tuition free. We can have a tax system in which the wealthy and large corporations begin to pay their fair share of taxes. We can create jobs by transforming our energy system and understanding that climate change today is causing devastating problems in our country and around the world. And whatever Trump and his EPA administrator may think, climate change is very, very real and is impacting the lives of all of us. So my message today is despair 
is not an option. These are tough times. These are tough times, but this country has gone through a lot of tough times in the past. Think back, you know, 60 years ago when little African American children in the South could not go to the schools, the decent schools in their community. They were segregated schools. Think about a hundred years ago when women in America didn't even have the right to vote, let alone get the education or the jobs they wanted. Think about not so many years ago when people in the gay community could not openly uh, make public their sexual uh, feelings. We have overcome a lot in this country and we will overcome what's going on today. The job is twofold, is to fight back in every way we can against disastrous policies like this Republican health, so-called health plan, which is really a tax breaks for the rich plan. We've got to fight back against cuts to programs that working people and low-income people need. We've got to fight back against the terrible anti-environment agenda. We have to do all of those things, but in addition to that, we have got to keep our eyes on the prize and understand where this country can and should be going. We can't only be defensive. We've got to be proactive as well. We have to have a vision for where the wealthiest nation in this country can go and where we can lead the rest of the world. So I want to just conclude by once again uh, thanking all of you. Your jobs are not easy, and I know that emotionally, uh, it is, I don't know that I could do your work, because every day you are seeing people who are hurt, who are being battered, you're seeing kids who are suffering unnecessarily, you're seeing decent people being pushed down, and yet your job is to do everything you can to give those people the support that they need. So from the bottom of my heart, uh, thank you all very much for what you do. Let's go, go forward together. Thank you. such a meek opening that it was the best we could do. Uh, I noticed that the uh, sign men over here are outside modeling the panel, so our panel is here for the next uh, presentation. What we'll do to keep this simple is we have three legislators entering at one time with David. I'll simply ask you to please welcome our panelists to the stage. And you can be raucous if you want to then, or you can wait till they're done at the end of the program and be raucous then. But what, we'll do it as a group because we don't just tell at the time, we do one at a time, so we'll just do that. But they are here, so uh, just stay at attention, and when we see David walk through the door, I'll bring you back. And, but you can visit a little bit, no music, but talk amongst yourselves. Thank <laughs> you. 